Okay, hello Adam. Uh, it's it's nice to have you here, and uh, thank you for giving me your time. Sure. So um, I'm gonna keep keep it short. I have two actual questions from the community from Finland, and uh, I would like to for you to for the for the starters, could you just def try and define Bitcoin in one sentence? So I think it's it's kind of uh, in terms of its value, it's like a digital commodity, so it's something scarce, and in terms of its properties, it's. Um, Permissionless, censorship-resistant electronic cash. Wow, that's very good. Um, I'm pretty excited about the developments on, in Bitcoin lately, especially uh, Snore signatures and Taproot. Could you comment on um, when do you think those will be uh, in full use? What are the actual implications and why are they important? Um, I'm not sure of the exact time frame, but... Uh you know, maybe late this year or next year. I'm, I'm not really kind of tracking day to day, but I did see that there were several BIPs, like specification drafts published recently and quite a lot of discussion on the technical forum. So, and then what, uh, what Schnorr and Taproot do? So Schnorr signatures are a more compact signature format, particularly for multi-signatures. So you can have, let's say a three of three signature and it looks the same size as one signature. The other advantage of it is that it uh, reduces fingerprinting, so you can't distinguish on the blockchain potentially between a two of two signature and a single signature. And then the other thing that's been proposed to deploy with it is Taproot, which is a, a different idea that Greg Maxwell introduced, which is that um, many, many Bitcoin contracts are structured as uh, ors right so it will say either the the owner has to sign with this key or something more complicated has to happen so there's a kind of programming branch in the code and you get fingerprinting because different types of uh, use cases have different scripts or contracts so you'll be able to distinguish let's say a lightning transaction from a green wallet transaction uh, which are both multi-signature use cases and that would provide some kind of fingerprinting, like which type of wallet is it, what kind of payment is it. So with Taproot, you can avoid that because the typical pattern is 99% of the time, only one branch is used. And occasionally something will go wrong and you'll have to use the other branch. So for the cases where the branch is never disclosed, Taproot can hide the existence of the branch. So you only disclose it if you need to use it. And you don't know for sure if it even exists, you know, from the outside, just looking at the transaction on the chain. So I'd say that uh, Taproot saves a bit of space and it greatly reduces the fingerprintability of different wallets, which indirectly improves kind of privacy and fungibility, that more transactions look similar. You may not be able to, for example, distinguish a lightning channel set up from a single signature payment from a multi-signature green wallet payment. They may all look the same after with Schnorr and Taproot combined. So basically that means more privacy and scaling, right? Right, a little more scaling because the uh, signatures are smaller. The multi-signatures become single-sized and the, the base uh, typical transaction just becomes a signature without like, you know, if, if, you, if you do a multi-signature with an OR branch, today you have to disclose the OR branch and you have to disc disclose the code and the code itself takes space so that you save that space normally. Wow, thank you. Uh, so the community question is regarding Blockstream Satellite, uh, which is a very awesome project. And um, I'm sure, well, you are familiar with Noddle, the personal Bitcoin assistant. And uh, for the viewers, it's uh, basically a small computer that handles the, the node, uh, a Lightning node, P PTCP uh, server and stuff like that. So I heard a rumor that uh, there's an integration between Blockstream Satellite and Noddle in the works. Is that true? And if so, uh, can we have a timeline? I'm not sure on the timeline, but I think there was some public discussion on Twitter about uh, uh, doing integrations like that. And there are some very compact uh, software-defined radio parts, like very small USB devices. And we have recently been able to optimize the software part of it because what it does to keep the cost low is it does analog to digital conversion using the USB dongle between the satellite dish and the computer. And then it does the signal processing 
on your laptop or uh, embedded computer's CPU. And in the, in the first iteration, it required a processor of an Intel i5 kind of speed, something similar to that. But the most recent version with optimizations, it runs on a Raspberry Pi 3 Plus, which is a uh, four core ARM64. So it's a fairly powerful ARM processor. But the whole computer with a Raspberry Pi 3 specification is about $45 piece of equipment. So it definitely brings the cost down from you know, a second-hand laptop with an i5 processor is not so cheap compared to a Raspberry Pi 3. And I think some of the nodes, like the Nodal, will have enough compute to do that, and we may be able to optimize further in the future as well. Oh, that sounds really exciting. Another question from the community is about the security tokens, which I heard you talk about also. And uh, I'm interested in your opinion, because there's a, there's a project called the Ravencoin, which is uh, apparently a big thing between some Bitcoin maximalists. And also in the in the Finnish community, it's, there's a lot of supporters for that because it's a Bitcoin fork, and uh, some somehow people seem to think that the uh, security tokens are the future. So, do you care to comment? Uh, what is the actual future of security tokens, and how does that tie into Bitcoin, or is there an, uh, would it be better to do on another protocol entirely? Yeah, I mean, so f I I tend to think that it's uh, most things can be implemented as extensions to Bitcoin as Bitcoin gets to be more modular and more layered in the same way that other protocols like the internet are organized. You know, with, with the internet, there's TCP IP, and then there is you know, HTTP for web browsing and SMTP for mail browsing and different protocols for voice and video. So with Bitcoin already, there's, there are multiple layer two things. So there's Lightning for retail payments and Liquid, which is a sidechain that Blockstream has been developing is a way to, is optimized it's another it's another layer two it's a side chain technically which means you can move uh, bitcoins between the main bitcoin chain and the side chain and back again so there's no kind of new coin new, no new floating coin introduced you pay transaction fees with bitcoin and because it's for the exchange trading use case liquid introduces a number of features including native support for issued assets which could be security tokens or US dollar, fiat coins, stable coins, or represent uh, as other underlying assets in the custodianship of a provider. So, and it also provides um, com better confidentiality, so confidential transactions. So the values, i.e. how many coins you transferred, how many dollars, how many euros, and uh, the type of the coin is also encrypted and yet it's still a public blockchain because you can run a full node and verify the integrity of the chain because the encryption is done in such a way that uh, somebody from the outside who's not part of the transaction can still see that the transaction inputs add up to the outputs basically and there are block explorers and full nodes and wallets for this and you know to create an asset is just a special kind of transaction so you pay the you know the size related transaction fee and you can create an asset now, of course, whether the asset has value depends on, you know, being able to persuade an exchange to list it and to persuade investors that, you know, something useful is, is being done, right? That there's, there's a startup using the funds raised to build technology or there's a custodian with some asset underlying it. So based on what you told me, do you think in the future, like let's say in one or two decades, uh, all of the possible viable use cases of blockchain or, or uh, tokenization could be covered with Bitcoin or do you think we still have a, some kind of a market for altcoins or shitcoins? Um, I mean, I tend to view it as the network effect winning and Bitcoin has a lot of network effect and a lot of focus on security first. So I think security and robustness is very important and, you know, if you think about the early internet, there wasn't this phenomena because there wasn't a way to, you know, make money or raise funds for development by making f copies or modified versions of TCP IP. And so it quickly settled onto one chain. So I think ultimately the network effect and sort of scarcity of development resources and the benefits of being able, having everything interoperate means that eventually everything will be on one one protocol uh, at, the ba at the base layer with different specializations above it. Um, so I'm not really, you know, a big believer in 
uh, so-called utility tokens, um, and I think things like uh, things things that are shares in companies can be done in in, in uh, layer two related, Bitcoin related networks like Liquid. So the, and you know the other kind of what if that people raise is what if some significantly better technologies invented in the future and and there are interesting technologies that are you know plausible but have big R&D questions left like efficient snark related technology with better security guarantees if some major leaps are made in that that could be applied to bitcoin to improve it so the way i see that working is not that a new coin would emerge but that bitcoin would adopt the technology and so people then will ask well is it possible to adopt technology and i say that Generally, it's possible to adopt any plausible technology because in the worst case, you know, you can always fall back to the method of starting a new network and importing the UTXO set into it and switching over to the new network technology. So it's kind of major version upgrade compared to a minor version upgrade where, you know, new opcodes are introduced and new efficiencies are added. So, yeah, I tend to think about things in terms of uh, single network uh, prevailing in the longer term. It's a lot of sense and I agree with you. Thank you so much for your time, Adam, and uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, thanks for having me on.